prayer. Gracious God, it's good to be together like this again. We pray that your Holy Spirit would guide our time together and um, would lead us into uh, deeper faith and a deeper appreciation of, of your sovereignty and your absolute righteousness, your justice, but also your absolute grace. You call all to turn from sin and death and receive the grace and forgiveness, rest, peace, and new life that you offer to us through Jesus Christ. We give you thanks and honor and glory and praise for who you are and what you do. Tonight, Lord, we uh, lift up to you Bill and Sue as uh, they grieve the loss of Bill's sister and just a few weeks ago, uh, the loss of Sue's brother. And we now know that Bill is going to be undergoing a medical procedure on the 21st, so we pray that you would give him healing and give encouragement to the family. I want to lift up to you also Wes and his wife Bernice and their family as they mourn the passing of his brother. We pray that you would encourage them and give them the peace of the risen Jesus. Lord, we ask that in all things, uh, the life of your church on earth would honor and glorify you and point to Christ as the way and the truth and the life. And uh, that you would steer us away from anything and everything that would keep us from being focused on following Christ and lifting up Christ alone. It's in his great and good name we pray. Amen. Well, we come now to a lengthy, uh, well, actually it's several oracles against Tyre. And we'll talk about Tyre in just a moment. T-Y-R-E. The British spelling of those things you put on your car. But it's actually a, a name that means rock. And we'll get into the significance of that in just a moment. Uh, oh, I see, by the way, Ken, you mentioned Rick, your friend Rick. We'll pray for Rick before we finish because uh, he's not only recuperating from uh, one surgery, he's got another one coming up, and we'll, we'll pray for him before we end this evening. Uh, so we have an, a series of oracles against uh, Tyre, which is essentially the capital of Phoenicia, uh, a land that, that hugs the coast of the Mediterranean. We'll take a look at some maps I included in the comments here in just a moment. And it was a, 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 a trading center of renown. You know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of... Um, Abu Dhabi today. There's so much wealth in this small uh, place called Abu Dhabi uh, in the Middle East today. And I, I'd rather think of Tyre in the same way. And, you know, um, wealth uh, can be a great blessing, but then the question becomes, will you control your wealth or will your wealth control you? Will you allow wealth to dictate who you are and what your values are? Will you allow it to delude you into the notion that you yourself are a god? And this is exactly what Tyre um, fell into. Now, we'll get into some of the details in just a moment. But take a look, if you would. I've, I've included two maps. This comes from the Kushal uh, commentary, which is a simpler commentary um, than, than the big one I consult all the time. But um, 
it has better maps. In fact, I'm not even sure that the, other than just a few general maps, there are any in the other commentary that I use. But the Kushal map, uh, Kushal commentary has two maps here uh, touching on this chapter, or these chapters of Ezekiel. The first document I included, I hope you can see it, because right now it's, oh, there it is. Okay, good. Uh, it's Judah and four surrounding countries at about 586 B.C. And you can see uh, Amman, and we talked about that, that country uh, last week, Moab, Edom, and remember the Edomites uh, were descendants of, of uh, yeah, of, of Esau. And then you see Philistia and, and Phoenicia there. So five countries. I said four, but it's actually five. Preachers don't necessarily know how to count. Um, so anyway, that gives you the context of all of this as these oracles against other countries begin, particularly uh, the oracle against uh, Tyre. Now, take a look at the other map, because this is really fascinating. Uh, this is touched upon in, the, uh, in our text, uh, our chapters for tonight. This map shows the trade of Phoenicia, that is the trade of Tyre, around this time. And you can see the, the position of Phoenicia is right there on the eastern boundary of the Mediterranean Sea. And so it's kind of a, I guess I used this analogy before, maybe I, I stole it from someone, but it's kind of an elbow, right? And it connects Europe, um, most directly Asia Minor, what we know, now know as Turkey, but it connects Europe, Asia, and Africa, and it sits right on the Mediterranean. Tyre itself was originally an island, uh, and in this period it would have been a, a, an, an island in the 6th century BC. Later on, when he conquered it and, and obliterated it, and now all Tyre is is a small village in Lebanon, but when, uh, when Alexander the Great conquered it in 332 BC, he built a causeway, and so Tyre became essentially the tip on the end of a peninsula. In these times, in the times of Ezekiel, it was a massively important trading city. And there was, you know, this conglomeration of great wealth. And we talked about another analog, which would have been medieval uh, Venice. It's a jagged rock island. And uh, the people of Tyre very shrewdly uh, traded with these three continents. And as became very important. And they were known initially for their uh, honest dealings. But after they became wealthy, two big things happened to them. And we're going to see God indict them for these things. One is uh, they became materialistic. Two is they became proud. And the third thing I should mention, the worst thing of all, was that they began to idolize themselves. They engaged in idolatry of the self. And so they became very proud and arrogant. And some of you noted that uh, I posted a quote from the Kushal uh, book today. Pride was uh, what really, uh, and idolatry, uh, are what really incited God's anger at Tyre. And what we're going to see is that after the fall of Jerusalem, Tyre, the Phoenicians, um, actually sort of celebrated this fall. You know, in, in a way, it eliminated uh, Judah 
as uh, a competitor for the shipping and all of this for these three continents at this elbow of the Mediterranean. Um, and they were part of the um, old people, if you will, the established people in the land when the people of God came into Judah. I mean, the, the Canaanites and some of the other groups <clears throat> that we talk about were roughly contemporaneous with the people of God in coming into this area. Uh, but the Phoenicians had been there a long time, and they looked down their noses, and they celebrated uh, what happened with the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So I think going through this will go rather quickly. Uh, there'll just be things for me to point out to you along the way. But let's go ahead and dig into it. Chapter 26, verse 1. In the eleventh year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, Aha, the gate of the peoples is broken. It has swung, swung open to me. I shall be replenished now that she is laid waste. Let me stop right there. You see what the, the people in Tyre and Phoenicia are saying. Our competitor is gone. Now uh, we can exploit Judah and we can exploit Judah's weakness or having been conquered for our own advantage. So they're simply celebrating the fall of Jerusalem. And uh, this is not okay with God. Remember, God disciplines his people, but that doesn't mean that he uh, dislikes them or rejects them. It means that he's disciplining them for the purpose of calling them to repentance and faith and renewal in their faith. So for other peoples to celebrate um, the suffering of the Old Testament church, which was Israel, or of God's people today, that's not okay with God. You know, it's sort of like when I was growing up and uh, I was one of five kids. And one of my parents' rules was that when one child was disciplined, none of the other four better crow about it. So that's God's attitude here. Uh, so this is why he says now what he says to Ezekiel, verse 3. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. Now, already we see something that's a little different from uh, when God had said he was against his people, uh, Judah, that he, had, he was going to discipline them. Here, what God is saying is that he's going to bring many nations. Remember, it was essentially Babylon at this point <clears throat> in 586 that was, I mean, they're the, they were joined by other peoples, but it was essentially Babylon that was coming after Judah. What we have hinted at here is that Tyre is not going to fall all at once. Babylon will begin it, but it's going to be another 250 years before Tyre is fully destroyed. What's going to happen in that, that period of time, though, is that the people of Tyre will remain arrogant and not chastened, but continually under attack until, as I said, in 332 B.C., Alexander the Great built a causeway out to Tyre and destroyed them. Verse 4. Now, he's going to use language that is not... The, the, the theory is here that Ezekiel is using um, kind of stereotypical language for one people conquering another. 
And the stereotypical language would involve siege language, right? Like Jerusalem was sieged. Um, it, this is not how Tyre is going to get conquered. Um, Tyre in 586 BC is an island. <clears throat> so it's going to be harried. It's going to be attacked. Nebuchadnezzar is going to go after Tyre and Phoenicia for 13 years. And this is just the beginning of the assaults that are going to happen, culminating in what Alexander the Great did. But he's going to, Ezekiel is going to use this kind of stereotype language. It's not to be taken as uh, Tyre was literally sieged, because you couldn't do that uh, with an island. Um, so, read on. Verse 4. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. Now, this is um, a play on words, a pun, because, as I mentioned, the word Tyre means rock. And so the rock, which is such an important city, you noticed all of those uh, on that one map, all, all of the, the uh, things that... Uh, Tyre traded in and shipped um, so they were very wealthy remember the shippers always take something off the top uh, so they were extremely wealthy but God is going to reduce the city known as rock to bare rock all right it's the utter humiliation verse 5 she shall be in the midst of the sea a place for the spreading of nets in other words all that's going to happen in Tyre from here on in is a little bit of fishing. It's not going to be this monstrously important city like Abu Dhabi is today, or New York City is today, or London, or Tokyo. For I have spoken, declares the Lord God. And there you get that avowal kind of language. What I have said, I will do. You know, God's word, we're told in Isaiah 55, does not return empty. This does not just refer to the law of the gospel. It also refers to the law, uh, excuse me, the word of the law. The word of the law does not return empty either. When God sets out to condemn, he condemns. And his word does that. And then the, his word of gospel does the same thing. So here God is saying, my word is not going to return to me empty on this. Uh, and she, Tyre, shall become plunder for the nations, and her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword. These are the satellite cities of uh, Tyre that are on the Phoenician coast, which probably acted as buffers. You know, one of the things that the uh, Russians believe, uh, this is just, inbred into their historic culture in, in, in the military is that you always need buffer states. I mean, that was the point of what Peter the Great did, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they want buffer states to protect the really important stuff. And um, they don't understand America's approach to national security, which is to form alliances with nations who are free and independent themselves. Uh, not because of our collective interest, whereas the Russians think in terms of self-interest. And so we want to have a Germany, a Ukraine, a Belarus. We want them uh, acting as a buffer for us. Well, these small villages in Phoenicia were buffers for Tyre. But what God is saying is going to utterly destroy these buffers. Uh, I'm in the middle of verse 6. Then they will know that I am the Lord. There's that formula again. Verse 7. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings. We've talked about him before. With horses and chariots. We talked about how horses are, are the means of projecting military power. 
and with horsemen and a host of many soldiers. He will kill with the sword your daughters on the mainland, those villages, those towns. He will set up a siege wall against you and throw up a mound against you and raise a roof of shields against you. Uh, this is interesting, this roof of shields. Um, this is from the crucial book. He says, when infantry advance toward a fortified walled city, they raise their shields above them to form a turtle shell type of protection against projectiles fired down from the walls. So that's the idea of this approach. Again, this is stereotypical language. So the basic idea here is that Tyre is going to be under assault. We read on. Let's see, where am I? Uh, verse 9, he will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. His horses will be so many that their dust will cover you. Your walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen and wagons and chariots when he enters your gates as men enter a city that has been breached. Now, I believe what we have here is an example of what I've talked about before, which is the telescoping. Uh, that in, that you see in prophecy, the, the telescoping of time. We're going to see a, another positive example of that later on. But uh, in other words, everything is leading inexorably to the destruction of Tyre, the punishment of Tyre, with Nebuchadnezzar as its initial um, uh, stand in for God, if you will. Um, and But many nations are going to come against Tyre, and this is all going to be at the impetus of God. Uh, verse uh, 11. With the hoofs of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword, and your mighty, mighty pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. I think that's interesting. Your pleasant houses. You know, the, the idea here is, you know, you, you look down your noses at Judah and you live in this luxury. But that luxury is going to be taken away from you. I'm in the middle of verse 12. Your stones and timber and soil they will cast into the midst of the waters. So there you go. Uh, this uh, island city on a rock. Yeah, it's going to be thrown down into the sea. Verse 13, And I will stop the music of your songs, and the sound of your lyres shall be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. There it is again. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets. There it is again. You shall never be rebuilt, for I am the Lord. I have spoken, declares the Lord God. Now, people will say, well, Tyre was rebuilt. Yes, it was rebuilt, but eventually it was destroyed as a major city. And it is, as I said, just a small and insignificant village in Lebanon now. Verse 15. Thus says the Lord God to Tyre. <clears throat> oh, uh, yeah. Uh, will not the coastlands shake at the sound of your fall when the wounded groan, when slaughter is made in your midst? Then all the princes of the sea will step down from their thrones and remove their robes and strip off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground and tremble every moment and be appalled at you. So you see what's the, the justice that's going on here. Here was Tyre uh, celebrating dismissively the destruction of Jerusalem. And now all of these princes and kings who are trading partners of Tyre and whose wealth depends on Tyre, they too are going to be impacted by this and they're going to be aggrieved. They will be not celebrating. They will be, uh, you know, lamenting. Uh, not just the loss of Tyre, but the loss to themselves because of it. You need to be careful 
who you align yourself with in life. If we align ourselves with unrighteousness, and when the unrighteous are uh, disciplined or punished by the, by the Lord, do we expect that we will not feel the ripples of that? And uh, do we think that we can long uh, prostitute ourselves and still maintain our faith and not be sucked into idolatry and injustice, just as all of these uh, client states of Tyre were, if you will. And this doesn't just apply to nation states. I think it applies to us interpersonally. It certainly applies in the realm of uh, government and, and, and business and so on today. We see this all the time. We are called to reach out to sinners, our fellow sinners, but we are not to co-conspire with them in their sin. Uh, verse 17, and they will raise a lamentation over you and say to you, how you have perished, you who were inhabited from the seas, O city renowned, who was mighty on the sea. She and her, her inhabitants imposed their terror on all her inhabitants. You see how uh, a once truthful, uh, fair-minded people once they became ensnared in the idolatry of wealth and the idolatry of self, uh, became a place of injustice and of uh, dishonesty. Verse 18, Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall, and the coastlands that are on the sea are dismayed at your passing. What's going to happen if this powerful entity we've we've hitched our wagon to, is now gone. Verse 19. For thus says the Lord God, when I make you a city laid waste, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you, so the sea is going to engulf you. Now, this again is not to be taken literally. This is figurative language, but remember what the sea represents in uh, the minds of God's people, uh, the Hebrews. Remember in Genesis 1, God's spirit moved over the waters. And the word that is used in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, when it talks about how God moved over the waters, the word that is, is rendered in Greek as bathos, now, we get the word bath from that, but bathos uh, has the connotation of an uncontrolled uh, stormy sea, uh, like the worst hurricane you could possibly imagine. And God's word, uh, God uh, through his word, God imposes his will, his peace and order and life on this chaos, which is stormy death. It's, it's like, a, like a black hole. It's negative life. And it's, it's chaotic and stormy. And God's word is imposed upon it. And life comes about. So that's the picture of the sea that the people of God have. Um, it was very common for God's people to be terrified of the seas. That's where... The, the, the great sea monsters, the Leviathan, uh, raged, right? And that's, uh, that has a, a connotation of, of, of being demonic and fearful. Uh, one of the reasons that fishermen were so wealthy was because nobody else really wanted to do the job. They were terrified of the sea. Um, so they were, you know, they got a high premium for uh, being fisher folk. 
Uh, and, you know, we see this, this image of the sea playing out all through the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you see um, uh, Jonah, the story of Jonah. He goes out and he is swallowed uh, by a great fish, we're told. Now, this would have uh, been a horrifying prospect to the people of God because they automatically would have assumed that this great fish would be a Leviathan. As it turns out, God turns the Leviathan or the fish, great fish, into an instrument, not, uh, not so much of Jonah's deliverance, but of the people of Nineveh's deliverance because, you know, he, he forces Jonah to ask for help in the belly of the fish and the fish vomits him out and he goes to Nineveh and he very reluctantly proclaims God's word there and people come to repentance but the point is that Jonah was so bound and determined to turn away from what God was calling them to do that he went into the sea he went out on a Mediterranean cruise, which would have uh, terrified the average uh, uh, Jew at the time. So then you have this come up again in the New Testament where Jesus uh, it walks across the water. Or no, I'm, I'm, I, well, he conquers the water. So they say, who is this who conquers the wind and the waves? Well, who is it? It was God who conquered the wind and the waves in Genesis. And then you have another incident where Jesus falls asleep in the bow of the boat with the fishermen and the other disciples as they're going through a, a storm. And even the seasoned fishermen are terrified that they're going to die, you remember. And so you have all of this uh, uh, imagery of, of the sea being a fearful kind of thing, a fearsome kind of thing. And so the idea here is that uh, the sins of Tyre engulf it. That's the idea here in this, uh, the, the deep going over Tyre and the great waters covering Tyre. Now at verse 20, then I will make you go down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of old. Now, this is Sheol. It's the place of the dead. It is hell. You are going to hell, Tyre. Uh, we, now, look. This message is being delivered. Tyre has undoubtedly received the message. Why is God telling Tyre all of this? Well, God wants Tyre to repent also. He wants all people to repent. So we see the universality of God's uh, uh, reign and his concern for all people. Let me, I've been babbling here. I want to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Uh, hi, Matt. Um, hi, Betty. Uh, couldn't get home any sooner. Well, no reason to feel sorry, Betty. Uh, I will pray for your son, David, for fairness at the court. Uh, we'll do that before we finish up tonight, Betty. So he's saying, I'm going to make you go down to the pit. Uh, to the people of old, I will make you to dwell in the world below, among ruins from of old, with those who go down to the pit, so that you will not be inhabited. Um, your, your, your city is going to be nothing. But I will set beauty in the land of the living. Right? This is a reference to uh, uh, wherever God is, including heaven, there is beauty. Verse 21. I will bring you to a dreadful end, and you shall be no more. Though you be sought for, you will never be found again, declares the Lord God. Curtains, absolute curtains for Tyre. Grim word. Let's see, what time is it? Because I, okay. Now, uh, chapter 27, a new oracle. The word of the Lord came to me. 
Now you, son of man, raise a lamentation over Tyre. So a lamentation is a word of grief and mourning. God wants mourning uh, to be stated for uh, Tyre, even though the people of Tyre have never worshipped Yahweh, because God loves all people and he laments the loss of anyone. And we're going to see Ezekiel bring that up very prominently in Ezekiel chapter 33 later on. <laughs> the word of the Lord came to me. Now you, son of man, raise a lamentation over Tyre and say to Tyre who dwells at the entrances of the, to the sea, merchant of the peoples to many coastlands. So this is, this is trumpeting what it was that Tyre... Uh, did and, and how it made its money and how it attained its status in the world. Thus says the Lord God, <clears throat> O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the heart of the sea, so it's an island. Your builders made perfect your beauty. They made all your planks of fir trees from Sinir, they took a cedar from Lebanon to make a mast for you. So here, the, the analogy that God is drawing uh, of, of Tyre is of a great sailing ship. And the basis of that is that uh, they had a fleet of trading sailing ships that came out of Tyre. And so he's, he's drawing this analogy of Tyre as being this great trading ship for the world. And you know very well about the cedars of Lebanon because it was the cedars of Lebanon that uh, Solomon used as the timbers in the first temp temple in Jerusalem. They were highly valued. To make a mass for you, it says in verse 5, verse 6, of oaks of Bashan, they made your oars. They made your deck of pines from the coasts of Cyprus inlaid with ivory. So here is this trading nation building themselves up with the produce and products of other nations around them. And this is the trading ship, if you will, that uh, a tire builds for itself. It's surrounded by water, like an island, like a ship, which God is going to bring down. Um, verse 7. Of fine embroidered linen from Egypt was your sail, serving as your banner. Blue and purple from the coasts of Elisha was your awning. You know, purple, any purple item was a very expensive item because it was made from these rare mollusks, the dye. Verse 8, the inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad were your rowers. Your skilled men, O Tyre, were in you. They were your pilots. The elders of Gabal and her skilled men were in you, caulking your seams. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in you to barter for your wares. Persia and Lud and Put were in your army as your men of war. So, like the Venetians, who had a, a limited... Um, number of people to draw from for their military and their navy, they recruited from other peoples. They hung the shield and helmet in you. They gave you splendor. Men of Arvad and Helek were on your walls all around, and men of Gamad were in your towers. In other words, they're the ones who pro are protecting you. They're, they're the outer, if you will, the outer wall of this ship which is Tyre. They hung their shields on your walls all around. They made perfect your beauty. Tarshish did business with you because of your great wealth of every kind. Silver, iron, tin, and lead they exchanged for your wares. Javan, Tubal, and Meshech traded with you. They exchanged human beings, so there's slave trade going on, and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. From Beth Togarma, 
they exchange horses. That's a big deal. Remember, Solomon got into the big time when he started dealing in horses. That was when that was a real mark of his wealth. And uh, when I was growing up in Columbus, just west of Columbus, there was a man originally from Mount Sterling uh, who got into the uh, the real estate and financing business and became very wealthy, bought this great uh, amount of ground west of Columbus called the Darby Dan Farms, and he became a breeder of racehorses. He also was the majority owner, and I think the family may still be, if I'm not mistaken, of the Pittsburgh Pirates. So when I was growing up, you know, we, we knew that people who had horses were wealthy. Well, uh, not only did they race horses back in, in the first century world, although the Jews themselves would have been horrified by that, um, and this is part of Solomon, you know, allowing the worship of other gods and so forth and allowing other culture to infiltrate the people of God. Uh, God's understanding of who they were and of God. Um, so, and, and, but they were really good for war. So th that was a s symbol of Solomon's wealth and power. They exchanged horses, war horses, and mules for your wares. The men of Dedan, remember we talked about Dedan last week, traded with you. Many coastlands were your own special markets. They brought you in payment ivory tusks and ebony. Syria did business with you because of your abundant goods. They exchanged for your wares emeralds, purple embroidered work, also very wealthy stuff, fine linen, coral, and ruby. Judah and the land of Israel traded with you. They exchanged for your merchandise wheat of minute, meal, honey, oil, and balm. So Judah uh, produced agricultural goods, and they traded with Tyre. Now, by the way, uh, it was uh, wheat, I believe, that Solomon traded for cedars of Lebanon to build the temple. Verse 18, Damascus did business with you for your abundant goods because of your great wealth of every kind. Wine of Helbon and wool of Sahar and casks of wine from Uzal they exchange for your wares. Wrought iron, cassia. I looked that up because I didn't know what cassia was. Uh, it's either strips of bark or buds of a plant having a cinnamon flavor or aroma. Cassia and calamus. Now I have to look, look that up. I did not do that. I should have. Oh, it says to look at Psalm 45, verse 8. Psalm 45, verse 8. Oh, your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. And so it says myrrh and aloes and cassia are expensive perfumes. Okay. Um, I'm back in Ezekiel. Uh, verse... Um, 20. Uh, Dedan traded with you in saddle cloths for riding. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar were your favorite, favorite dealers in lambs, rams, and goats. In these they did business with you. The traders of Sheba and Ra'amah traded with you. They exchanged for your wares the best of all kinds of spices and all precious stones and gold. Haran, Kanai, Kane, Eden, traders of Sheba, Ashur, Hilmad, traded with you. In your market, these traded with you in choice garments, in clothes of blue and embroidered work, and in carpets of colored material, bound with cords and made secure. The ships of Tarshish traveled for you with your merchandise, so you were filled and heavily laden in the heart of the sea. Now, what's the point of all of this? It's just to convey to you how wealthy and powerful Tyre was. And God is going to bring it down. 
verse 26, we go into another lamentation. Your rowers have brought you out into the high seas. The east wind has wrecked you in the heart of the seas. Your riches, your wares, your merchandise, your mariners and your pilots, your caulkers, your dealers in merchandise, and all your men of war who are in you with all your crew that is in your midst, sink into the heart of the seas on the day of your fall. So this is not to be taken any more literally than the language in the last chapter about a siege. Uh, what you're to draw from this is the complete destruction of Tyre. Verse 28. At the sound of the cry of your pilots, the countryside shakes, and down from their ships come all who handle the oar. The mariners and all the pilots of the sea stand on the land and shout aloud over you and cry out bitterly. They cast dust on their heads and wallow in ashes. Of course, this is a sign of grief. They make themselves bald for you. Uh, also a sign of grief, shaving one's head. And put sackcloth on their waist. And they weep over you in bitterness of soul with bitter mourning. In their wailing, they raise a lamentation for you and lament over you. So this is interesting. This is a lament within a lament. So Ezekiel is offering this lamentation from God. And in the middle of it is quoting a lamentation. Uh, verse 32. Who is like Tyre, like one destroyed in the midst of the sea? When your wares came from the seas, you satisfied many peoples. With your abundant wealth and merchandise, you enriched the kings of the earth. Now you are wrecked by the seas in the depths of the waters. Your merchandise and all your crew in your midst have sunk with you. All the inhabitants of the coastlands are appalled at you. And the hair of their kings bristles with horror. That's a really evocative image, isn't it? And their faces are convulsed. The merchants among the peoples hiss at you. So here you go. Here is the condescension that with which Tyre greeted news of the fall of Jerusalem. Now they are being hissed at and condescended to by other peoples. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. So, The, the sin and the repudiation of God is so complete in Tyre that its dominion is forever destroyed. No matter what uh, group of people arise to live there later, Tyre, as it was known uh, in ancient times, is, is going to be utterly destroyed. Now, this is what is going to happen to the universe, except for those who trust in God. So it's a very interesting foreshadowing of the end times. And we're going to see a glimmer of the gospel in chapter 28. It's already 951, so... Uh, I didn't get through three chapters. I got through two. But we'll pick up on chapter uh, 28 tonight. Yeah, I noticed your uh, message there, Ken, that you were simply uh, letting Rick know that the, the study was ongoing. And Betty, we will pray for David right now. Let's just do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this time in your word. Um, it's a reminder that you are the sovereign God and you take sin seriously. We pray, God, that we would be open to your word as it calls us to repentance and faith, that we might trust in the grace that has been given to us in Jesus. We pray for David as he goes to court tomorrow. We ask that the entire, he will be treated fairly and that the entire proceeding 
will comport to your will. And Lord, we pray for uh, his family. And um, we pray for Betty. We pray that you would give to them every encouragement. Father, we ask that you would give us a good night's sleep and that we will wake up tomorrow refreshed and uh, live in the freedom of the gospel. We pray that you'd help us to, to share the good news of Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. I, we, we covered a lot of territory, but uh, uh, I, think, I think we did it justice. So um, we'll see you tomorrow night, by God's good grace, at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, receive a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. See you.